Well, Kirk, it's uh, great to catch up with you uh, under any circumstances. Right now, these are certainly unusual ones that uh, we're all experiencing for the first time, and everyone's lives have been turned upside down during this quarantine. How have you approached it so far? Well, we've just tried to maintain normalcy as best we can. You know, as a football player, this is kind of a downtime to begin with. So of anybody, we've probably been affected the least. Uh, that could change come, you know, a few weeks from now if our off-season program's affected or next fall, certainly. But right now, through the month of March and early April, I'm just training in my driveway. I'm used to going to a facility <laughs> to train, but now I'm in my driveway and I'm uh, just using technology to connect with my trainer, but still getting the work done. And I've uh, been able to play catch with, you know, a neighbor or my brother, whoever's around. And my my arm's still getting the work. So I think we found a way to, to make it work, but... Uh, it's been unique, to say the least. How important is it for you, Kirk, to have a routine every day? Well, I like to have schedule. And obviously, during the season, that's very easy. It's dictated to you. But mm -hmm. in the off season, you have to be disciplined on your own to create it. And so I start with planning out uh, my workout times, which are usually booked around when my wife is available, when my kids are available, and trying to fit that puzzle together. But I usually work out in the morning and then create a nice routine. Know when my, my boy's nap time is, is when I get on calls like this. So uh, just try to plan out the day. And when you do have routine, I find I can be much more productive and take advantage of the off season as opposed to just kind of uh, existing through it until we start up again. Yeah, like you mentioned, as, as we stand right now, this isn't anything unusual, but you do have, uh, obviously, like all of us, have a lot more time with your family uh, in closed quarters for the most part. So how are you guys handling that uh, with any sort of mental claustrophobia? <laughs> yeah, that's been the hard part, I think. I'm a person who wants to go out and experience things, and I want to create opportunities for, for me and my family, and certainly that's been restricted. But, um, you know, we make it work. You, you can always read a good book. You know, my mom was saying to me when I was a little kid, go read a book. <laughs> yes. And that, that those four words still still work. Uh, so there, and those house projects that I put off for a long time, or you know, going back through old boxes of memorabilia that I had saved, and you throw in a box, and you just say, "Well, someday I'll go through that." Well, the past few weeks has become someday. That was the time to go mm -hmm. through. So I've tried to you know take advantage of it the best I can. Any particular TV show you guys are locked into? Or are you staying uh, trying to main uh, minimize your screen time? You know, I, I, I haven't minimized my screen time by any means, but uh, the boys, you know, I they, they want to watch different shows and kids stuff. And honestly, at times, just putting on a program for them is a lifesaver. Yeah. <laughs> to just kind of give, <laughs> you know, it'll get their attention and then I have my freedom for a few minutes. But uh, selfishly, you know, I end up watching back through old TV shows, The Office and Parks and Rec. I've had a hard time oh, finding yeah. a new show, but I love documentaries. So if I can find a good documentary on a historical event, uh, specifically, you know, I love American history. So if I can find one along those lines, I'll get glued into it. And then the Disney plus, uh, app, oh, yeah. uh, and I've been using that. There was a cool documentary on what they call Imagineering, kind of the guys who did a lot of the stuff inventing their rides in their parks. Uh, I thought that was a really cool documentary series uh, about Imagineering. You mentioned, well, there's, there's physical shape, staying in physical shape, and then there's football shape and, you know, tossing the football around with some of the neighborhood kids is one thing, but as time goes on, uh, I know Kyle Rudolph kind of weighed in on this as well, reading an article about you guys. How do you kind of get back into that thing if you're not allowed back into the building? Yeah, it's a different uh, deal. You can only prepare so much. Ultimately, 11-on-11 11 11 football and what that feels like can only be simulated when you're back playing mm -hmm. football on the field with 22 people. It's really hard to practice that. It's very different from basketball where you could go play five on five and, and get a feel for that on your own in the offseason. You know, even uh, baseball, much the same. You could face a pitcher and just have you a pitcher and a catcher and be able to get a lot of work in or field sure. ground balls. Football, you know, you can simulate it and do your drills, but there's a big difference between wearing shorts and a T-shirt and running around and putting on the full gear and playing with 22 guys. So at some point, boy, we need to get back and need to get to work. How does it feel uh, overall? We really haven't had a chance to talk about this, to be locked up by, by the Vikings for the next couple of years. Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, we're thrilled. Uh, Minnesota was where we wanted to be. Didn't want to even address the thought of looking elsewhere, and um, it was a win-win. And I think I'm always looking for win-wins, and to be able to do an extension was was a win-win. Uh, 
there's always a process involved in these things. Were you uh, convinced, even when the season ended in San Francisco, as the weeks progressed, that the the message was loud and clear from management, from Vikings management, and with, through your representation, that you were going to get this deal done? Well, I think you never know, but it was really healthy dialogue. I think that's what I've appreciated mm-hmm. from uh, Rick Spielman, George Payton, Rob Brzezinski, is the communication was really healthy, and my agent just kept um, – complimenting them to me and just kept saying how classy they were through the process, how upfront they were. Um, and so it was about as smooth as a contract negotiation can be. And um, I think that says a lot about the leadership of the Vikings and, and the mm-hmm. way they do business. If you would, Kirk, uh, kind of discuss the impact of having Gary Kubiak return really as a true offensive coordinator and your relationship with him. Well, I think it was the right move by Coach Zimmer to have Gary be the OC. Um, I'm grateful that Gary accepted that opportunity and, and has, has taken it because uh, it gives us some continuity. Uh, you know, we, we did lose a couple staff members, which is always tough, but a reality in today's NFL. I think our offense will be able to stay very similar to what it was last year. There will certainly be adjustments, but to have a similar offense with the same quarterback coach in the room, the same, you know, leadership in place both in the O-line room and then from Gary uh, at the top of the offense I think that helps a great deal so I'm I'm thrilled that he's uh, mm-hmm. the ROC. Kirk uh, you've mentioned you are a people person and uh, with that in mind and given what we are dealing with right now you've been trying to keep in touch however whether it's FaceTiming texting with the likes of some of your teammates with Adam Thielen and Kyle Rudolph and Dalvin Cook or maybe your, your fun guys on that offensive line that we had a lot of fun with under center last year. Yeah, there's been an ongoing dialogue. Uh, we were trying to get together to throw here. Would have been about three or four days ago is when we would have done it. Uh, we were planning all February to, to get together in early April to throw somewhere outside of Minnesota, and we had to cancel that. Uh, mm-hmm. We were on some group text as we discussed the CBA, which was negotiated and and uh, is now our new CBA moving forward. So going through that process, there was a lot of dialogue. I've hopped on the phone with a teammate from time to time, and we do a little weekly uh, Bible study with our chaplain, Tom Lampier, mm-hmm. conference call every Monday night over the last few weeks. So we just had a conference call with about five or six teammates there too. So I think having those moments where you connect reminds yeah. you how much you miss them. And uh, one of the benefits of the off-season program is just that social time to be back together and spending time with one another. And I think we'll all miss that if we don't get back here soon. It's crazy how we take all that for granted, isn't it? That it's life is always going to be that way, no matter how simplistic and how routine things are. Now everything is upside down. Yeah, things you take for granted are, are not there. And um, it's been a great reminder to me that there's only so many things in life you can take to the bank. And a lot of other things you just don't know. Yeah. And, and it's taught me to kind of hold things loosely and, um, and to really value what's important. Kirk, you reached out to, to uh, Stefan Diggs after he was traded to Buffalo. Why was that important to you? Well, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty obvious. He's been a, a really impactful player uh, for the Vikings, for my career. Um, you know, when Adam Thielen got hurt last year, uh, obviously Stefan made an enormous difference in our success as an offense and as a team, especially in Adam's absence. Um, loved playing with him and mm-hmm. just felt like you always need closure. You know, it's hard to move forward until you can, you know, have that communication and, and close that loop. And so I wanted to make sure that there was communication and, um, you know, he's been nothing but, but good to me uh, all the way through our relationship. Uh, the NFL Draft will become uh, the only live sporting event we've had in some time since the uh, the shutdown. Uh, how uh, how much will you watch of it, uh, thinking of uh, looking ahead to the, the draft coming up? Yeah, I'll tune in. I mean, there's not much else going on. So if ever there was a year to tune in to be this year, um, every year I play, I start to value the draft more and more. I start to see how teams that draft well and then can develop those draft picks well how much of a difference it makes. And so uh, you look now at the number of picks we have this year with uh, mm-hmm. the amount of depth in the draft, and you realize this is a big deal. Um, and when you think back to the rookies that have contributed for us the last couple of years, uh, boy, drafting's a, a big deal. So it's going to be fun to have a sporting event again. I think America will 
uh, will kind of unite around the NFL draft. And I think that's great for our country and great for our sport and for our league. Yeah, everyone's anxious to see something other than replays of great games that we've all been watching. <laughs> Watch whether it's Tiger Woods winning last year's Masters or Brett Favre leading the, the Vikings over the Packers, which I saw as well, which a lot of people tuned into. Uh, speaking of the draft, Kirk, walk us through the atmosphere on draft night and the draft weekend for you. Uh, were you with your family? What it was like? You had to kind of stay patient through uh, the third day, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I was an early pick on the third day. Thankfully, it was still early on the third day, and I didn't have to wait around <laughs> too long. You know, I wasn't expecting to go in the first round. So Thursday night, I was truly just watching. Uh, certainly, you know, you have your phone available, but I wasn't expecting a call. Friday, you know, second and third round, I was hopeful that I would get a call, and, and that call never came. And and um, and then the fourth round, you know, early on Saturday, I got a call. And looking back, the chance to go play for Mike Shanahan and also on that staff was Kyle Shanahan, Matt LaFleur, Sean McVay. You know, honestly, if I had been picked in the seventh round or not drafted at all, it was more important that I went to the mm -hmm. right place. Really, getting to the right coaches, the right system, the right team is far more important and pays dividends for you in the long run. And I'm just yeah. grateful that my path has led me to, to Minnesota where I can sit there and have peace about the people I work with and the organization I play for um, because that's so important. Reflecting on your own, uh, as you mentioned, your own draft uh, draft day and draft weekend uh, situation, what, what advice do you have for uh, this year's prospects? Yeah, I think my, my, one thing that always gives me pause is when a first-round pick or a high pick starts to feel like they've made it because they were drafted mm -hmm. high. They treat the draft as a finish line rather than a starting point. Uh, from my experience, whether you were picked in the top 10 in the first two rounds or later in the draft, yeah, there's probably a little bit of an advantage when you go into training camp. You're going to get your opportunity more than the, than the other guy, but you better play well. You know, there's a lot of pressure and you better deliver. Uh, teammates are counting on you. Now's the time to get to work. Um, and then to people who are drafted later or are undrafted, I would just say, you know, you're going to you're going to have an uphill battle. You know, they're going to give every benefit of the doubt to the higher pick. But uh, if you do take advantage of your opportunity and and you're going to have limited opportunities, but if you take advantage of them, they're going to find a way to keep you and uh, you can get just as far in your career as you want to go. So um, the draft is really a starting point. It's not the end game. Well, you're likely to have, uh, obviously, a, a new receiver or two. Uh, to throw to with uh, Diggs's uh, departure and a few other moves as well, but that's that's you're used to that uh, in this uh, ever evolving revolving door of the National Football League, aren't you? Yeah, I think you know you said it. The revolving door is a part of playing in this league, and while you'd love to have more consistency when you go back to college or high school, you know you had your guys that you played with, and that was kind of the way it was, short of an occasional change. In the pros, that's just not the world we live in, and it's become a new reality and you accept that reality. So you, you understand there's going to be turnover and you understand the sense of urgency in the spring and the summer to get new players caught up to speed. And to be honest, that was me two years ago, getting caught up to speed with the Vikings coming from another team. So um, that's just new normal in the NFL. And, and the teams that can handle that well are the teams that end up winning. No one knows how this is going to play out, Kirk. So how do you you know, mentally kind of prepare yourself to uh, the unknown. I mean, to, to kind of keep yourself in that mode of knowing what you have to do to get ready for a season when we really don't know with the mini camps, OTAs, right. uh, training, you know, all that sort of thing that you, you have to do to become, you know, continue to be the player you are and, uh, you know, the teammate you are. Yeah, I think we'll just pace ourselves and understand that uh, assuming the season were to start on time, you know, in, in mid-September, that that's really the the goal. That's where we're trying to build towards. We're not trying to, you know, be the best team in the world in late April. That's not when they measure it. So, you know, we're going to use April, May, June, July, August to build towards September. And and I've kind of always viewed it that way as a player, especially as I get older. But now more than ever, it's just important to pace ourselves and make sure we're building so that when we get to September, we're peaking at the right time. And um, you know, I think even in in, in the world of COVID nineteen. Uh, we mm -hmm. can still take that same approach. Could you envision uh, playing games without fans? Yeah, I mean, it can happen, certainly. I mean, when we scrimmage against teams uh, in August, and um, shoot, it would take me back to my younger days when I played in front of very few people. So <laughs> I, I, I want to play, and whatever adjustments have to be made to do that, 
then let's make the adjustments. Uh, I just don't see a, a reason to, you know, have excuses for not playing. I think we should try to make it work however we can because we want to play. And I, per, I believe that our, our, our country, our, our culture, in mm-hmm. a way, needs us to play. I think it's, it'd be healing, and I think it would be a win for society to see uh, football on TV in the fall. I'm not saying that it's the most important thing in the world. It certainly isn't. But I think if we can do it, let's find a way to do it. Uh, the Vikings have been active uh, in free agency. You've been kind of keeping up the speed on that. You, added, you did add another wide receiver, but... Uh, overall, and, and still the draft picks to be had. You like the feel of, of the direction of this football team and knowing what you have coming back? Absolutely. I, I have no complaints. I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of depth. I think players like Anthony Harris and Rashad Hill and Dakota Dozier coming back on the team, you know, those are question marks that you wonder who, would we be able to keep them or have them around. And uh, knowing that they'll be back is is a tremendous boost to our team. And, uh, um I'm excited to have them. So we'll keep going and, and keep developing young players. You know, we have a lot of draft picks, and so the story's still being written for the 2020 roster. But uh, I feel great about the moves that have been made and kind of where we're headed. Do you feel, Kirk, really that you're – if you look at the arc of your career, that you are really smack in the prime of it as we speak, heading into what we hope will be a, a very successful in 2020-21 uh, season? Yeah, Rosie, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I do think that there is a sweet spot where you're still young enough that your body and your arm uh, is as good as it's ever been or as healthy as it's ever been, and I, I do feel I'm in that place. But then you have to also factor in that it takes years to build up the experience and the mental reps such that you know defenses don't fool you as easily and, and you have time within a system to really become a, a master of it. And so when you factor in all those variables, I think being going into year nine, being in a system for now a second year, being with the Vikings for a third year, uh, mm-hmm. and feeling good physically and feeling like I can do it all, uh, you know, athletically, uh, yeah, I do think it's a sweet spot, and I'm excited about that. And one of the reasons why I say let's play ball when it comes time to this yeah. fall. We haven't had a chance to talk about anything else going on in the league, but obviously the headline, uh, Tom Brady, no longer a New England Patriot, now with the Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, what are your thoughts about Tom Brady moving on from Bill Belichick? Well, it goes to show how much I know because all winter when I was asked, and I was asked quite a bit, my answer was I just don't see a world where he's not a New England Patriot. So it surprised wow. me as much as anybody. Um, just goes to show what we've been talking about, that change is the one constant. And uh you never know what this league will throw at you. So I'm disappointed that he's now in the NFC. It would have been nicer to see him stay over in the AFC. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be facing him this year. And, and um, I know that his experience and his ability and his competitiveness, you know, elevates that team instantly. And, um, you know, we've got to be that much better. And maybe we'll leave this with uh, maybe uh, you sending a message to Viking fans who are watching this kind of what uh, what they should be thinking about as well as they they look forward very much more than ever I think to to, to a season uh, which we all hope uh, will be there come September. Well, we just look forward so much to getting back to work, and uh, this off season has reminded me what it's like to be a fan. And you know, I, I wanted to sit down and watch the Masters Golf Tournament. Uh, yeah. Oh, and it wasn't on TV, and you realize, man. The, the void in my life w- without sports is a big void, and, uh, and that's just as a fan. So I'm just so grateful for our fans, for how loyal they are, for the, the, the pride that they have in cheering us on. And um, Yeah, I, just, I, just, I guess this COVID-19 has made me appreciate them more than ever. And uh, I know that it will cause, when we do get back to work, whenever that is, even more of a, an appreciation even more of a, um, an energy from them. And, uh, I just, you know, I'm working out in my driveway right now and, and dreaming <laughs> of the day we're back at it. And so I think thinking of our fans and their support kind of keeps you going and gives you that edge as you continue to prepare. Kirk, good catching up with you. Stay well, my friend. Okay. Thanks, Rosie. Appreciate it.